The views expressed herein reflect the views of the Whistler Agency as of the date of publication. These views may change as conditions change. The views expressed herein are not intended and should not be construed as investment advice, and they do not address any individual's specific situation. Welcome to Whistler While You Retire with Tim Whistler from the Whistler Agency. Here you will learn how Tim helps clients avoid taking unnecessary risks in retirement. With a fiduciary responsibility, Tim's mission is to help retirees and soon-to-be retirees create a greater sense of confidence about their retirement plan. Now, on to the show. Thank you for joining us for another episode of the Whistler While You Retire podcast. I'm Tim Whistler, president and founder of the Whistler Agency. The world as we know it is going more and more into a virtual environment. So much more detail is being compiled in the digital workspace than ever before. Whether we are using the internet for the social element, maybe to plan a vacation, or to do our jobs, our information is exposed and constantly at risk. So what can we do to exercise internet safety to protect our information? And how do we keep our kids and our grandkids safe while they're online? Well, joining me today is a friend and a longtime client of my practice who is absolutely brilliant in what he does for a living. He has worked in the information technology since 2001 and currently works as a cybersecurity solution architect at VMware Carbon Black. He helps customers lock down their production environments across the medical, the legal, and private sector, working, working with large corporations, protecting their laptops, and desktops across thousands of devices worldwide. He teaches his customers how to do threat hunting across their devices and helping them to lock down their proprietary information and intellectual property. He holds 12 industry certifications, including the MCSE, the Microsoft Systems Certified Engineer, and the CEH, the Certified Ethical Hacker Certification. So needless to say, he's a little qualified in what he does. So I'd like to introduce you today to my guest, Mr. Kirk Hasty. Kirk, thank you for joining me today. Hi, Tim. Thanks. Glad to be here. I'm glad you're here, brother. So you are celebrating your 20th year in this industry. So tell me, you know, tell us about, you know, what you like to do most with this business. Yeah. So uh, I like to honestly help people. That's the reason I'm here today. I like to uh, talk to people about uh, technology and using technology safely. And uh, I think technology is great, but it's uh, kind of like anything. It's like a, a driver's license. Like you learn to drive, uh, you need to have a license. So, but we let everybody just get on the internet and do whatever uh, <laughs> they want to do. So um, if you kind of put in some guardrails, especially if you have children and things like that, it can really help uh, have a good experience and make sure that um, they're safe. And we also need to protect our information out there. So uh, I like to I like to teach people and empower them um, to be able to use the internet as a valuable tool, um, but also to be safe out there when they're out there. Perfect. So I got to ask this question too. I mean, the, the threat of identity theft and data breaches, it just never goes away. It's ever present. And you're engaged in this. You've been doing this for 20 years. So so we got to believe that you, you got to take a break at some point, right? To recharge your energy, kind of take an escape. So what do you like to do in the downtime when you're not out there protecting everything about us on online? Yeah. Um, so I'm a big uh, uh, bass fisherman. I like to go bass fishing. Um, even though a lot of people go uh, casually fishing, I I do get into fishing quite a bit. I try to kind of, um, though I am a casual fisherman, I study uh, fish patterns and things like that and <laughs> water temperature. And so that's probably the geek side of me that um, <laughs> likes to uh, go maybe a little all in. But um, but I do find fishing is, uh, fishing is relaxing for me when I get out in nature. Everybody knows you're not going to get hold of me on my phone. It is uh, turned <laughs> off. I don't even look at it. I don't want to know what's happening out there. Uh, if I'm at the lake, I'm at the lake. So... Good for you. That's that's the way to do it, man. So yep. perfect. Well, well, I'm excited to to dive into this. And, and to our listeners, if you don't already have it in front of you, pause here to go grab a pen and a paper because you're going to be provided with some very helpful and vital information. So again, as we know, our information is in the cyber world. It's collected by nearly every entity in which we engage. Hackers work tirelessly to breach the firewall so they can steal information and sell it to the highest bidders. So, you know, we occasionally hear about breaches, but Kirk, can you share some figures regarding the volume and frequency of data breaches? 
Yeah, yeah. I wanted to talk a little bit about the volume because a lot of people don't realize how big a problem this truly is. So um, in 2020, for example, Microsoft lost 250 million records. And uh, when we're talking about losing records, that's a lot of times your email address, your phone number, um, sometimes uh, you know other things, maybe, maybe your social security, maybe not with Microsoft, but um, account information, what all you've purchased potentially through them. So we're talking about quite a bit of information, maybe a credit card. Um, there was also another uh, AIS, which is Advanced Info Service, uh, lost 8.3 billion records. And KeepNet Labs lost 5 billion records last year. Um, billion, right, with a B. Goodness. Um, and there's also a solar winds. Anybody who's in uh, technology right now uh, knows about uh, there's a solar winds breach. It's, this is a major supply chain uh, uh, problem, and it's still uh, not known the full effect. But anybody who's in IT uh, is, is aware of solar winds, and really it hasn't been determined the full um, capacity here, but how long they've been in people's networks and things. So um, a lot of times these breaches, when they happen, still sometimes can take months or even years to figure out what all actually was lost um, because people don't just come out and uh, sometimes tell when they've uh, taken advantage of something like this. Um, another interesting stat in the U.S., I think, is 49% of companies have dealt with a data breach. Uh, not all companies actually um, let people know when they have a data breach, unfortunately. Sure. So there could be a higher number than that. But um, big companies definitely have to uh, have to acknowledge that they've had a data breach to let their uh, consumers know. Yeah, on that point right there, when you said some companies don't, um, you know, record the breach, is that something that's being regulated? Or who, how do we get, you know, how does that determine when a company has a breach? How do they determine when to share that information with the consumer and when they don't? Yeah, that's a great question. Some some may not report it, uh, maybe because it could be bad for their brand, but mm -hmm. many don't report it because, frankly, they don't have the tools. They don't have the cybersecurity wow. expert who works at the company who actually knows that they've even been breached. So wow. some of these companies are just as surprised as everybody else when they suddenly hear there's a breach. Um, they, they weren't aware of it because they didn't have the right tools to monitor or the right personnel um, you know, to be aware of the situation. So Goodness. So there's definitely more than we, we even know about, right, that the numbers can say because some companies are unaware that they've been breached. Mm -hmm. gotcha. um, just to give an example, back a few years ago in California, um, in 2008, lost 5.6 billion records were exposed, um, public yes. records, right, of their of their constituents in the state. Mm -hmm. uh, New York lost 293 million records and had 729 breaches. So... Um, I always tell people nowadays when they ask, um, should you just assume you've been breached? Yes, you should assume you've been breached at some point. Um, you can be breached by uh, malicious attackers. You can also be breached even by insider threat, which is somebody working at the company that may decide to suddenly um, back something up and sell it to somebody or take information out. So there's uh, there's lots of different uh, ways to, to do this. Um, so it is something to be aware of, and, and most companies really should assume that they have been breached or lost information and should put a program in place to try to uh, keep that at a minimum and to try to keep up with uh, modern technology. Gotcha. So so you just said probably what most of us are thinking, we, you know, have I been breached? And pretty much we need to assume that we have been breached. So, so how can we know if we have been breached? Is there something out there we can kind of check on to see if we have been breached? Yeah, there's a pretty cool website out there that you can uh, go to. And so um, the URL is have, H-A-V-E, I, and then Ben Pond, P-W-N-E-D. So H-A-V-E-I-B-E-E-N-P-W-N-E-D.com. Uh, Gotcha. Have I been pawn.com? You can Google it too. It'll come up as your first search. Um, okay. When you look this up, you can put in your uh, email address or you can put in your phone number and it will show you um, if you have been breached, if your records, um, if you're out there somewhere uh, on the dark web, likely. Um, you will likely show up. And so when I when I talk to people about this, they say if, they, if their number shows up, the first question they have is, well, what do I do? Well, right. we're going to talk about that today. Here, I'm gonna, we're going to give you some advice of what to do. If you don't show up, the answer isn't, oh, I don't have to do anything. The answer should be, I still need to do these things to make sure I don't show up down the road. Um, you can't you can't really make other companies do things and protect your information, but you can do your best to protect your information and you should do your own due diligence here. Perfect. No, that's that's great. Um, so, you know, we talk about the digital footprint. I've heard that terminology before. So, you know, what are those elements that make up our identity online? 
Yeah. So when I, I think of this, I think of uh, really about four different vectors. Uh, there could be more, but these are ones that um, people can identify with pretty easy, like financial. I think everybody knows uh, my bank account. I'm paying payments online, maybe for my uh, my electricity, my water, things like that. Um, any kind of online payments for school loans, uh, loans in general, um, anything you're purchasing, uh, your history um, would be useful information for an attacker. Um, um, different payment methods. There's so many different payment methods nowadays. Um, sure. Do you use check? Do you use credit card? Do you use PayPal? Do you use gift cards? Um, lots of different ways to um, purchase things. So all of those information, right, are uh, basically a treasure trove to um, an attacker or a hacker out there who wants uh, your information. Mm -hmm. um, when we're thinking about personal information that's valuable, um, obviously your name, um, your address, your birthday, um, education, where you've worked uh, could be helpful, um, your different interests and hobbies. And the reason that is, is because a lot of people, um, especially your personal things, a lot of people use their kids' names and their passwords. Um, or if their hobby's baseball, they're going to make a password with baseball in it. Um, and so the more they know about you, uh, the easier they can start trying to guess uh, your passwords. Because I've had people tell me, well, who cares if somebody knows that I like baseball? Well, um, <laughs> if you're a, a certain team's fan, you may use that in your um, passwords and things, right? So uh, sure. it is important to uh, just be aware of what information you're sharing out there, um, besides with your personal friends. Mm -hmm. um, and then behavior, speaking of um, sharing things, right? Social media, uh, tons of people share tons of things that 15, 20 years ago, people would never have shared um, out right. on social media. Uh, we're going to talk a little about social media today because there's definitely some things everybody should consider uh, when you're using social media. Uh, location tracking. Is your phone tracking everywhere you're going? The answer is yes. Uh, wow. Is that information getting out to uh, people to see patterns of where you go? Where do you spend your time? Were you where you said you were? Uh, all kinds of different things. And then the last one that I find most people don't tend to think about it much is uh, biometrics. So biometric things are like on your phone, maybe you have a fingerprint reader. Um, fitness trackers, if you're wearing like a Fitbit, uh, is that tracking all of your information? It is. It's tracking your steps. So is it? Uh, is that information getting sent anywhere? Um, uh, face and voice recognition, right? A lot of people now can look at their phone and it gives them, well, uh, that's also another thing that an attacker would love to be able to uh, take a picture and have that, right? And could get into your phone or other, other things. So um, all of those are really things that we want to try to protect as much as we can. Sure. And, and my goodness, what, what a list. I mean, so we've got, just to kind of review, we've got the financial part of it, all of our bank accounts, online things, our, our spending. We've got the personal you know, it's like I tell people years and years ago when we were talking about this, I remember this conversation coming up and I've had people tell me, well, I really don't do a whole lot online because I'm nervous about the internet. Well, if you, when you leave the hospital or shortly after you leave the hospital, after you're born, you have a name, you have an address, you have a social security number and you have a birth date. And that's our personal information. And a lot of hackers, I know they can use that information and create it a whole different identity and just take it from there and create havoc on you. Then, like you said, Kirk, we got the behavior. Now we've got the biometric, you know, the face recognition. It's just incredible. And, and you talked about social media. I know we want to hit on that next. And, you know, this is one of the things that just absolutely just makes me shake my head. Okay. Far too often, people are just being so transparent on social media. Like, for example, look at us. We're going to Disney World, right? You can see the jet taking off. And they're like, what is, what are people thinking, right? You can't right. be that, you can't be that transparent. So when it comes to social media, you know, what should people be aware of when they're actually on social media and, and sharing their information? What should they avoid? Yeah, Tim, that's funny because I just the other day was on, uh, somebody said they were going on a trip and I, every, I just cringe when I see my friends and <laughs> family, but that every time it's like, no, post yep. your pictures when you get home, uh, then say we had a great time at Disneyland or whatever. Uh, right. Don't post that you're going to Disneyland for two weeks. You've just let everybody know you're not at home for two weeks. Um, exactly. It, people do it all the time. Share after. Uh, there's nothing wrong with necessarily sharing with your family and friends, but um, think about do you really want everybody to be aware that you're leaving your house uh, right. for, for an extended period? Um, also, when you're sharing things, um, be aware that you're not sharing them publicly. Make sure you're sharing it with friends. But um, I do tell a lot of people when they're like, well, if I just share with my friends, it's probably okay. Just realize your friends of friends can see things. Um, anybody can take a screenshot, right? So somebody I don't know, Tim and I may be on Facebook, for example, together. Uh, Tim has friends that I don't know. I have friends he doesn't know. Um, 
my friends could possibly see his post, especially if he tags me. So, um, and all <laughs> social media tends to Instagram, LinkedIn, all of them tend to work that way. So just be aware that when you think only people that can see my posts are the ones that are my friends, that is not always the case. Sometimes it's friends of friends, which suddenly your circle becomes much larger. Um, so yeah. don't post anything out there that you don't feel like if the whole world shouldn't know this, I probably shouldn't be posting it on social media. <laughs> uh, that really is uh, could sum it all up. But um, but there is a few other things too. Uh, online surveys, I see these all the time on uh, Facebook. Is that um, you know when you answer 15 questions about yourself, um, we would never give that information away. Basically, you just gave it away to everybody and then send this to all your friends and then they do it. Before you know it, 20 people are uh, on this post. All of them have shared all these different questions, their pet's name, all these things. Have you ever seen when you go sign up at a bank or things like that, they always ask, what's your your pet's name? What street address mm -hmm. did you live on as a kid? You ever notice the survey questions are a lot of times the same ones? Amazing. Um, yep. Any attacker suddenly now has that information. They don't even have to look for it. They don't even have to dig into you anymore. They just go and, oh, you're posting everything on a survey. They, they collect that stuff. So um, a lot of times they're the ones that even have started a lot of those uh, fun surveys. So something to be aware of that you probably should not engage uh, on those things. Wow. Um, I talk to high schoolers sometimes, several different times I've talked to high schoolers. Um, future job employers use social media. So when you're um, going to go out and start looking for a job for the first time, if you're posting things out there that could be offensive to people or that uh, maybe doesn't speak highly of certain people or um, just get into um, drama basically online, um, yeah. then other people could see that and that could uh, hurt you down the the future, 20 years from now, something you may have changed your view on something, but if somebody finds that old social media post, um, something like that could really come back to haunt you. And, uh, and, and I've had people tell me, well, I'll, I can go and I can clean up um, posts and things like that. Just be aware nothing is truly ever deleted out there. Um, on your page, it could be deleted, but there's servers that are hosting that information that still have it. Um, another cool site, if you guys ever want to go back and look at it, is something called uh, the Wayback Machine on the internet. So if you go to archive.org uh, slash web, basically there's 552 billion pages uh, that have been saved over time. So if you want to see, hey, back in 1989, for example, um, I want to go back and look, or I want to look at AOL's homepage back in 89. You can go do it. Um, AOL's not even, they're not around now. So their page isn't out there anymore, but you can look and see exactly in 1989, what did they post? What was the news of the day that day? Um, so so when somebody thinks it's gone out there, it's probably not gone. So just Goodness. be aware that uh, whatever you post out there. So again, think before you post. Is there anything here that I'm posting that could offend somebody or that I don't want later to, uh, you know, to have out there? Just don't put it out there. That makes sense. Think before you post. I'm actually writing that down right now so I can remember that for myself Perfect. because that's I, important. I have to do it too. Even though uh, <laughs> I live in this world, I still have to think about what I'm going to post. Yep. Um, another thing I, I like to tell people when they ask me, um, they want to sign up for Facebook and Instagram and all these things. Um, just realize that, um, and they want them to be free. Um, mm -hmm. They are not free. I told a lot of people, they're like, well, it didn't cost me anything. It did cost you something. You, you are the product when something is free. Um, wow. Google isn't hosting, uh, giving Gmail and all their storage away for free. Uh, Facebook is not giving you Facebook to upload all as many thousands of pictures that you want for free. They are selling that information to advertisers uh, and marketing. So be aware that um, there is no such thing as a free lunch. That's a good saying. It still applies today. Uh, it is not free. So uh, just be aware out there that uh, if I'm going to post information and upload my family photos and things like that, that um, it is out there. Okay. Um, you are the product and they will sell that to advertising, advertisement companies and things like that. Sure. Um, Makes uh, sense. Another thing, especially with teenagers, though, this can happen to adults as well, uh, cyberbullying. Um, social media has made cyberbullying a, a big topic. And during COVID, I think it was even bigger because everybody was stuck at home. Everybody is online. People that didn't even want to be online suddenly got online. Yeah. Uh, there's more people than ever online right now. I mean, we're still kind of in the middle of this. Mm -hmm. So cyberbullying is something that... Um, you know, as a parent or a grandparent, you want to be aware of if your kid's um, getting bullied or if they're doing bullying of other kids. So uh, we'll talk a little bit later. I want to bring up about some monitoring your kids and things like that. Um, but cyberbullying is something that uh, some people don't tend to think about uh, when they're thinking social media, but it is something truly to be aware of. Um, and then the last thing, again, is those surveys and things like that is just... Um, 
uh, be careful. Um, a lot of times those are used in passwords. Um, also, uh, uh, phishing emails, if you guys are familiar with uh, emails, right, that are trying to get you to click on a link and things like that. Um, if I, if I'm, let's pretend for a second, I'm the attacker. If I know Tim likes football um, because I've read a, enough surveys about him, I may start sending him uh, a few questions on football and tell him, here's a great link, go watch this. Um, he may click on that and suddenly he's somewhere that uh, he didn't really want to be, right? So yeah. um, they will use those things against you because again, you're just handing them information. Um, so they know things about you that other people wouldn't unless they're your direct friend. So be aware of what you're sharing out there. Great advice. My goodness. Uh, you know, and, and you said something too, that I think is a great transition for the, for the next topic, that dreaded word password, right? If we want to visit a website more than once, it usually requires our favorite element password. So, so what is, you know, what should people do, you know, when it comes to managing their passwords for all these different websites that they're, that they're visiting online? Yeah, so um, you could use a password manager. A password manager um, will keep track of all of your passwords in in one place and securely. Um, there's lots of different examples out there. You can Google to find them. I'll just give you a couple just so um, so you guys can go out and do a little research on your own. Uh, LastPass is one that's online. There's another one called One Password, which are both online. They're stored in the cloud. Everything's encrypted. Um, there's another one called KeePass if you don't want your things out in the cloud. And you want to keep it on your local device, uh, KeePass can uh, work very well. Uh, the only thing to be aware of something like KeePass, I've had some people use KeePass, it's great, uh, and it is a secure product, is if, you, uh, if your machine suddenly crashes and dies and all your passwords were in there, you could lose those. So yeah. that is why some people do want the cloud so they can access that in case um, they'd have a, you know, their computer malfunction at home or something like that. So just something to keep in mind. Um, uh, another thing with passwords is don't reuse passwords. Uh, I know people do. I've worked at enough corporate places that um, <laughs> you can almost start guessing passwords. Um, when it's spring, suddenly it's spring 2021. <laughs> um, and you can start running passwords through and finding people's passwords pretty easy. Now it's summer. Oh, um, and my company makes me change every quarter. I just go by the seasons, right? Um, wow. yep. There's there's patterns like that that people tend to do. Um, don't reuse your passwords. Don't have a different password for every site. That sounds intimidating, but if you have a password manager, it's really not that hard. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing I tell people when they when I tell them to sign up for something like this is, if you have tons of different passwords out there, don't don't let it overwhelm you. Just do one. Okay, if I'm going to go do my banking um, three days from now, the first time I log into my bank, I'm going to go change my password. I'm going to generate a secure password. I'm going to change it. A couple of days later, I go to pay my uh, my Amarin bill, uh, for example, my utility bill. Mm -hmm. If I'm going to pay that, when I log in, I'm going to change the password. So after a month or two, right, you'll have changed all these passwords, hopefully. Um, so don't feel like I suddenly I have 50 passwords. I'm just not going to do anything because that's not the not the right way to, to go about it. Just do it when it's convenient, but start changing these and don't have any of them the same because uh, hackers out there, a lot of times, if they can find a password um, on one site, they'll go out and see, oh, um, I'm just going to use Tim as an example because he's here. Tim's on Facebook. Tim's on LinkedIn. Tim might be on Instagram. I'm going to try the same password on all three of those. What other sites is Tim interested in? I'm going to try that on every site that I think he may be associated with. And a lot of people use the same password. And of course, now I'm into multiple sites. So Goodness. you may you may find out your bank could send an information saying, hey, um, Tim, we just found out at Capital One, somebody signed in as you okay, I'll go change my password. The problem is I have that same password on five other sites. Um, yep. They could be logged into those as well, right? And then the other companies may not know. So again, don't use, use different passwords. Um, if people out there have heard of uh, two-factor authentication, two-factor authentication is a key to uh, when data breaches happen. So earlier I gave you that site, I've been pawned. Mm -hmm. If you see you have been... Um, Basically, you've lost your password and stuff. Using two-factor authentication requires when I sign into something like a Gmail, for example, I can sign into Gmail, but then I also have to uh, get a code from my phone. My phone would generate a code. This code will help you. So if somebody, for example, in China suddenly uh, figures out your Gmail password or your Facebook password, they also need that six-digit code, which changes every 30 seconds. So they have to have your phone. So that's why it's called two-factor. Besides a password, my other factor is something I physically have in my hand, which is my phone. So using this will significantly improve your security. So today, if you are a little overwhelmed or you don't put in all these in place, that's okay. But two-factor is one of those things I would suggest that everybody out there try to put in. Um, 
use that smartphone instead of um, surfing and playing games and things like that. Use it as a security device in that instance that it can help uh, protect your information. Um, you can download for free Google Authenticator, which is a free uh, two-factor, um, or Duo Security, which is also free. Um, and there's other paid-for programs out there as well, but those two um, should take you all the way. Okay, perfect. Good advice. Um, you know, as we as we continue on here, we're we're talking about when we're on the internet, right? And the most of us are doing using the internet at home, right? So we go out and we purchase some type of, you know, network device. So when we're browsing the internet from home and we're using that home network system, no doubt, I mean, I'll speak from personal experience. I don't speak this language. So no doubt when I set up our home security system, you know, we leave ourselves exposed without even knowing it. So, you know, so how do we better secure our network as well as the devices that we use? Yeah, um, I would say routers and uh, firewalls and things like that have come, um, uh, they're better than they used to be. Ten years ago, they come out of the box with the default um, username and password. Don't leave it those, please. Uh, if you still find a vendor that does that, don't leave it the default. All that is is a Google search and suddenly now somebody's into your network. So um, change change those. Um, sometimes, by the way, you cannot change the username. Sometimes it's like admin and you have to leave it admin, but you can definitely put a secure password in there. So change it from the default. Something, again, hard to guess, use your password manager that we just talked about a minute ago. Um, use a firewall. Uh, a lot of people uh, aren't sure exactly what a firewall does. Just think of it um, if you're going down your street, all of the signs, um, all the streets that branch off from your street have street names. Um, so an attacker can see uh, all those street names. If you have a firewall on, uh, it's basically invisible. All these other signs, they, they may see that you're on, uh, like my uh, internet provider does Xfinity. They can tell that I'm on Xfinity, but they can't necessarily see all the things that I'm connected to and branched out to. So uh, it can help keep you somewhat invisible online. Most modern day operating systems like uh, Apple and Microsoft, uh, Android or iOS, uh, all have a, a firewall that you can uh, use. So definitely turn those on. They're free. Uh, there's no reason not to use it. It will help um, protect you. Um, if you have a Wi-Fi router, make sure you have encryption turned on. Uh, a lot of times, if you simply walk through the wizard, um, that it will set it up uh, to encrypt it. Uh, sometimes it will give you the choice of which uh, encryption you want. You may or may not know which one to choose, but um, you could do a Google search, but uh, always choose to, to do the strongest encryption possible. Uh, some just automatically put it uh, in the strongest encryption. Just okay. never choose to leave something wide open uh, on your home network. Um, that's just asking for, for trouble. Sure. Um, when you have people come over, make sure you lock down your Wi-Fi. Um, I do let people on my Wi-Fi, but, um, but I connect them to my Wi-Fi if, okay. if I want them to. I don't want people just to walk in and connect to my Wi-Fi um, because you can see other devices on the network and things like that. Um, another thing that I find people when they talk to me about um, things at their house and stuff is, Kirk, should I put on this security update? You absolutely should. Any of your products that have security updates, when you see them, put them on there. Um, okay. This is the vendors trying to protect you. There's probably a known issue. They're trying to put that out there, expecting you to put it on. You need to put it on. Don't let that sit there for 20 days, right? And, oh, I'll do it later. I'll reboot later. Um, put it on, reboot. It, it puts you in a lot better spot. Um, it's hard to blame um, anybody else when I'm not even willing to put on uh, an update. All I have to do is click yes and let it let it patch, right? So pretty mm -hmm. easy, but uh, try to maintain that. Um, antivirus, make sure you have antivirus on your devices. So uh, on your Android, your iOS phone, um, there's a lot of free different antiviruses. You can also pay for one. Okay. Feel free to look out there to see what you want. Um, if you're going to be in like a hotel or things very often, uh, if you're going to stay, if you use Verizon or T-Mobile or something like that, you can stay on their network. Um, if you have a data plan that doesn't give you unlimited data and you want to go get onto Wi-Fi, you may want to consider using a VPN. A VPN will protect and encrypt your connection so you're not on um, some hotel Wi-Fi that may or may not be uh, very secure or locked down, right? I don't want to say hotels don't know how to lock it down, but some hotels, frankly, don't. Um, somebody may have just set up a Wi-Fi router, plugged it in, next, next, finish. It's done, but it's not really very locked down. So you can assure that your information is secured uh, by using a VPN. So with the VPN, I, I like that recommendation. So how do we go about using a VPN? Is there a certain like website that helps us do that? Or how do we go about getting a VPN? Uh, yeah. So there's a uh, different, uh, there is some free VPNs out there and there's also some paid VPNs. Um, it's relatively cheap. Um, I use Nord VPN. Uh, okay. Nord VPN for three years, I think is 
forty dollars or something like that, um, uh, which is not very much. There is some free ones out there as well. Um, do your research. Make sure again, if you get a VPN when you set it up, um, you don't. Ne- it's not necessarily. You don't have to be technical to set it up. It will try to set it up as the most secure uh, connection possible. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so walk through that. The vendors obviously they know if you're buying a VPN that you're trying to lock down your environment. So. It is something to definitely consider if you're going to be, um, if you're a road warrior out there or you're traveling often, it can be very, very helpful. Perfect. You know, and, and we talked about this a little bit before, but, you know, using the internet as a shopping tool. I mean, I mean, I know it's so convenient just to simply go to Google or DuckDuckGo or whatever and just type in, you know, gifts for my wife or something like that. And just, just a slew of information pulls up in front of us so we can do some shopping and keep it relatively simple for ourselves. But at the same time, though, we need to be smarter about how we shop on the internet. So what are some of those things that we, some of the things that we can do, Kirk, to kind of help us when we're shopping on the internet? Yeah, there, there is, there's millions of sites out there, right? And there's new millions every day. So there's no way you can keep up on all these. So I, I like to, when I've talked to people is use websites you trust that you're familiar with, right? Everybody knows who Amazon is, walmart.com. Um, Businesses like this have to, they have full security teams. Um, you know, they're a major retailer. They have to uh, have security teams that look over these things uh, that try to secure their systems. Uh, they can still be breached, but um, it's a lot better chance with a website that you have that uh, they would also reach out to you. Um, they have a brand to protect. Uh, Amazon and Walmart want to protect their brand. If something happens, they want their uh, the people that shop there to know uh, something happened and that they're doing something to help them. Um, they they want to protect their brand when it's X Y Z, some company you've never heard of uh, that just spun up a website last week. Uh, you, it's not it's not as easy to feel as comfortable with them that there's any kind of brand assurance or that they really care anything about you. Um, so that's important. Also, in this most modern websites would have this, make sure on the left-hand side, when you type in the URL, like uh, google.com or whatever, uh, you should see a lock on the browser in any of the different browsers that are out there. Um, if you just go to like Google, you're not going to see sometimes a browser or the little lock button. Um, but anytime you're on a shopping cart, when you're doing any kind of surfing uh, to buy something, you should always see the lock. Uh, this means they're using uh, SSL, which is secure socket layer, which is encryption. Okay. okay. So you want all that connection encrypted because you're going to be sending a username and a password likely through there and yep. your credit card information. I don't want that out on the internet. So I want to make sure that's encrypted. That's again, goes back to um, stick with some of those websites that you're uh, familiar with um, that are going to protect your information. Gotcha. Um, use strong passwords. We mentioned that earlier. Don't, don't reuse. Um, gift cards can be very helpful. When you pass a gift card, if you go to like, for example, Kroger sells lots of gift cards or Walmart, you can go buy a gift card there. I'm a lot more comfortable passing a gift card. That's not my credit card. If they, if they, yeah. It's a hundred dollar Walmart card, and I, if something happens to it, well, uh, that's a hundred dollars that could possibly be lost. It's not thousands uh, potentially. So gift cards are a good way if you're not a lot real comfortable with uh, using credit cards online. You can use uh, gift cards. Um, another thing that I really like is I use virtual credit cards. Really? Okay. What, how does that work? Yeah, so there's a cool site if you guys want to look out there called privacy.com. And um, you can create a virtual credit card. And basically, uh, when you do this, it will, um, just like the front of a credit card, you'll see your numbers and you'll see the expiration date and a three-digit security code. You can create these on sites that um, that you want to make payments on. And uh, I do this sometimes, especially if I'm going to go to a site that and it's not an Amazon or a Walmart, it's some fly by the night, but it's a great price. I may want to buy something there, but I sure don't want to hand them my credit card. Um, I can spin up this virtual credit card, uh, basically provide them that information. And the cool thing about it is, let's say the item's $90. I can say, I want to put $90 on this card. So the worst uh, I could lose is $90 if something happens. So I can control and they can't run it up any more than that. I put $90 on the card. It can only be spent up to $90 after that. It comes back um, transaction denied, right? You mm-hmm. can't do that. Um, they have a free, uh, if you want to do it for free, you can do 12 cards a month, uh, which is fantastic. Um, if you want, and, and privacy.com does have a paid version. If you do that, I think you can do, um, I think it's maybe up to 30 or something like that. Some yeah. of them, even if you pay for a program and it's pretty cheap, um, you can even get cash back on your purchases. Some people use these and don't use a credit card online. They just use privacy.com and do all of their payments through there. Um, you can set this up, by the way, for uh, single use. You can set it up to say, hey, monthly, I want this to reoccur. Let's say my utility bill is $200 a month, for example. I could say every month, $200 goes on this card. They're the only vendor that has that. If anything ever happens, I know who lost my information. 
makes it real easy to know. Um, or if I'm handing everybody my credit card and I've dealt with 10, 10 different companies that month and, and something happens, it could be any of the 10. Here I know because the only one that has that one unique card is this one vendor. Um, so it's real easy to track down maybe who's who's doing what uh, with your information or if they're protecting it. Um, so that that can be very helpful. Uh, definitely go out there and take a look at privacy.com. Privacy.com, that's perfect. And, and I'm guessing that we fund that particular credit card with like some type of online account, like a like maybe pal, PayPal or something like that? Or how did- Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, you can, uh, you can use PayPal. You can set it up okay. directly to your bank. Um, okay. And so it makes it makes it real easy. It's very easy to spin up and you just create a new card. Uh, you create a new card anytime you want. Very cool. You know, as we start kind of putting a bow on this presentation here, I know one of the things that we still have to need to cover that's very, very important are our kids. You know, the kids today are growing up using this technology. You know, they use it in school. They use it at home all the time. You know, the innocence of a child is a huge target for cyber criminals. And, and we as parents and grandparents need to know more, you know, about how, how can we implement safety for our kids and grandkids. So, so maybe what type of software programs, Kirk, would you recommend for our kids and grandkids? Yeah. Uh, so I've talked to a lot of parents and, and grandparents um, at my church, at, at the school. Um, once people hear what I do for a living, they quickly come up and start asking me about things <laughs> about my kids and um, do your kids, how to, what do you do for them? And uh, right. so, so let me tell you first what to look for in some parental software, and then I'll give you some ideas of some out there that maybe you want to check out. So the things I tell people to look for is I want to have reporting and ideally reporting is going to be things like daily. Um, I want daily, uh, maybe an email. Basically most of them will give you an email daily of, um, of where the kids have been uh, online, you know, what they're doing uh, weekly and monthly, ideally. Uh, this way you can kind of see a trend like daily is nice because I know every day, but I like to see over a week or a month, I can start to see trends. Oh, they're spending a lot of time on social media or seems like uh, most of the time they're chatting with friends or they're on game forums, whatever the case may be. Uh, you can start to see some patterns and kind of know uh, where your kids or grandkids are spending their time uh, when they're on their devices. Um, and an overall online dashboard, a dashboard just makes it easy again to kind to see uh, where everything is, how many devices and apps and things like that that they're running. Um, be aware, right, that your kids uh, kids nowadays have smartphones. Um, mm -hmm. They can go into another room and you're not necessarily in front of them. It used to be much easier when we all had a desktop. Right. Um, you could put the desktop in the family room where everybody could walk <laughs> by at any time and see what was happening. Yep. Now with phones or they can go over to a neighbor's house and you may not be aware. So uh, just be aware that it really should be on all of their devices um, to, to, to protect them. Um, time limits are helpful too. How long do you want your kids or grandkids online? Um, maybe two hours a day, maybe it's four hours a day, maybe it's more. Um, obviously a lot of this is something that grandparents or parents can decide depending on their age and how responsible and things like that they are. Um, and then filtering content. There's millions of new websites a day. Um, I, I wanna make sure when I'm getting a software package like this that they're updating uh, daily, uh, basically. So, and they have filtering content that adapts. So for example, you can go after categories, like I wanna block pornography, for example. Well, there's new sites all the time. I wanna make sure uh, the kids can't get to that. Um, uh, different forums, uh, maybe there's, you know, weapons and all different kinds of uh, categories. So categories are very helpful because, um, or keywords, e either one of those can be very helpful when you're trying to block certain things um, for their protection, especially when they're younger, you can always go back and um, open some of that up. I've done that with my kids as they've gotten more responsible and now they're teenagers, you can slowly start uh, allowing them to go to more places, but um, just to have a, a kid have unlimited access, um, probably is not a good idea. Even for adults, it can be uh, risky, right? There's lots of things out there that uh, things can happen. So um, social media monitoring, if your kids are on social media, we already talked about some of the things to be aware of there. Uh, just be aware that they are on social media. What are they sharing? Um, as an adult, I have to think about what I'm sharing. Kids don't think about what they're sharing. A lot of times they don't know, they don't think 18 years in the future, is this gonna come back to haunt me type of thing. Uh, sure. Sometimes as an adult, I even tend to forget that. So uh, <laughs> we have to assume that uh, younger kids are not gonna be thinking, oh, is this really a good post? Would everybody, they're not gonna think through all that. They just post uh, what yeah. they want. Yeah. Um, so be aware if they're on social media, um, you probably should friend them as well to make sure to see what they're uh, doing out there. Um, another thing that a lot of parents when I've talked to them didn't realize that 
lot of these softwares have is a panic button or family locator. A panic button is nice if uh, on my kid's device, if they suddenly got into trouble or needed something, they could um, basically hit this uh, button on their on their app um, and it will uh, alert me instantly. I'll get emails and texts um, that can be helpful. Um, and a family locator, right? If, if, if they're somewhere, uh, I can kind of keep track of uh, where they are and uh, things like that. And, and when we, uh, one other thing, just with, with kids, I always say, this is something, again, you don't have to lock down uh, everything and uh, go approve every single site. But um, so if you use categories, it's much easier and then allow your kids as they show uh, they're more responsible and things like that to, uh, to broaden out. Makes sense. Perfect. So what are some examples, maybe a, a program or two that you talked on these, these details of these different characteristics of these types of programs? What are a couple of examples that you might recommend for us to, to go out and implement? Yeah. Um, so two different ones that I know of that are uh, really well done is uh, Custodio. And Custodio is spelled, it's a little different spelling, Q-U-S-T-O-D-I-O. Uh, that's what I use. I uh, really like it. Uh, it has all these requirements, by the way. And NetNanny is another one that a lot of people have probably heard of. Um, both of these are paid for programs. I've had a lot of parents say, is there free ones? Yes, they're garbage. I'm uh, just <laughs> going to be transparent. Most of them, yep. um, when you have a free program, the developers are not um, spending the time and putting in all of these features. Um, you're paying for features here, but this is to protect your kids and grandkids. To me, this is money well spent. I spend $40 a year to have monitoring on my children. To me, that is nothing in the grand scheme of things compared to what uh, could happen out there or places or, or uh, things like that that can happen. Um, so to me, it's uh, money well spent. Um, there is free programs out there, but the problem is they don't update very often. Uh, your kids can get into sites that you really don't want them to. It, it puts you at a disadvantage. So um, if you're not going to spend money on some of the other programs, because I gave you quite a few free ones today, this is one where it may make sense to spend a little bit of money. Um, that's a family evening out potentially um, sure. but for a whole year. So it's really not that expensive. When you break it down per month, it's very cheap, um, yeah. but it can really protect your kids or grandkids. Awesome. So, so again, just to, just to review that it was Custodio, which is Q U S T O D I O. Yes. And then the other one was net nanny. Yes. Correct. Gotcha. Okay. Awesome. So Kirk, we have covered a ton of information in a short amount of time. I can't believe how quickly time has gone. And a lot of this information is no doubt new and important for our listeners. So as we wrap up our conversation, I want us to share some action steps that will help people implement implement these recommendations right away. So what would you say are the best takeaways for our listener? Yeah. Uh, the first one I think I mentioned earlier is use a password manager and use unique passwords for every site. Um, it's the number one. That and two-factor authentication are, are both huge. So uh, go back and listen to this um, if you if you miss those or you want um, to listen to that again to make sure you understand um, about that. Um, another thing I think is take steps uh, to protect yourself and your family. Um, you need to protect your family, kids especially. Um, mm -hmm. There's a lot of things online that they could get into trouble. Um, I remember as a kid on TV, you know, your parents would limit what you'd watch and or make sure that um, things have to hand a kid a phone or a device and have no kind of restrictions at all and just let them have unfettered access to the internet is probably not a good idea. So, yeah. um, and we need to protect ourselves too. We need to take steps. So if you can do some of these things, you will substantially increase your protection online. And then you can enjoy the fun part of being online and all the good things that are out there. Um, and then another thing, I, I, when I talk to people about this, people head start to swim a little bit. There's a lot of information, like Tim said. Um, and so I like to tell people, well, especially since this is recorded, you guys have an advantage. Go back and listen to this again. Uh, implement one or two of these. Um, use them for a little while. Now I want to go back and listen to it again, and I'm going to put another one or two of these in place. You don't have to tomorrow or today suddenly put all of these in place and think you have to do all of these. Um, if you're a little intimidated, I'm going to focus on one. I'm going to, I'm going to start getting secure passwords. Or if I have kids and I am concerned where they are, I'm going to go buy the parental software. I'm going to focus on that for now. You can always come back. Uh, small steps will make a big difference. Um, it's, it's like anything when you're training uh, a boxer or a basketball player, or a baseball player doesn't um, suddenly just walk up and um, is great at what they do. They trained. So you can use the same kind of thing here. Small steps will make a big difference. If you put some of these into practice before over time, they'll, it'll become much easier. You don't have to be a technology uh, wizard necessarily, um, but this will put you heads or tails above a lot of people that frankly aren't doing anything and that are very easy targets for the attackers. Um, and that's a big thing I didn't mention, but I do mention this to uh, cybersecurity people, even when I talk to them every day, um, is that 
there's so many different uh, things out there that attackers can go after, uh, and there's easy targets, basically. Don't be an easy target. Make it hard enough that they're going to pass you over and go get somebody that's doing nothing, that's not yeah. doing any of these. Uh, if you just put in a few of these, you're already a, a lot farther ahead of a lot of people, and that puts you in a lot better spot, and you're not an easy target. They'll go after other people that just frankly aren't. Fantastic advice. Kirk, thank you so much for carving time out of your day and, and for being a guest with me on my podcast and share this information with us today. Sure, Tim. Always great to talk to you. And I hope uh, everybody out there uh, got some useful information and it was good uh, getting to talk to everybody. Awesome. Well, thank folks, you. there you have it. Thank you so much, Kirk. I mean, you have been presented with some helpful and vital information and, and ways to implement internet safety for you and your family. Be sure to take action and of what you've heard today. Do exactly what Kirk said. Just, just go back, listen to this, implement one step. And then a week later or so, come back, implement another one. Just, just do this in steps. And, and like he said, before you know it, you will have completely changed the scope of your internet safety. And be sure to please tell others about this episode, you know, because I know that your friends and family will benefit from this information as well. Be sure to hit the subscribe button so that you can receive alerts when we have produced a new episode full of content that we hope you find to be enjoyable, relevant, and helpful. So thank you again for listening in today and joining us for another episode of the Whistler While You Retire podcast. I'm Tim Whistler, hoping that you have a great day. We'll talk to you again real soon. Take care. Thank you for listening to Whistler While You Retire. Click the subscribe button below to be notified when new episodes become available. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guest and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of the Whistler Agency. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional investing advice. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service provider with any questions you may have regarding your investment planning. Investment advisory and financial planning services offered through Simplicity Wealth LLC, an SEC-registered investment advisor. Insurance, consulting, and education services offered through the Whistler Agency. The Whistler Agency is a separate and unaffiliated entity from Simplicity Wealth, LLC.